as part of this program. Uh, fortunately, we're supported very generously by the Foundation for Psychocultural Research. And with some of that money, we're, we're able to bring in very distinguished speakers for public talks like this one. And uh, today, it really is my honor to uh, introduce Professor Lawrence Kermeyer, who is, uh, as I said earlier this afternoon, he's one of the most uh, renowned uh, cross-cultural psychiatrists in, in the world. He is, uh, he's got so many titles, it's, uh, I will name just a few, but he is the James McGill Professor and Director, Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry at McGill University. He is also the editor-in-chief of the journal Transcultural Psychiatry. He was uh, the founder of the annual summer program, um, an advanced study institute in cultural psychiatry at McGill University. Uh, he founded and he directs the Network for Aboriginal Mental Health Research um, in Canada. Uh, he's the author of uh, literally hundreds of uh, articles and edited books. I'll mention three of the edited books um, uh, that he has organized. Uh, one is called Current Concepts of Somatization, uh, one that was uh, um, uh, part of a, an FPR conference actually, is called Understanding Trauma, Integrating Biological, Clinical, and Cultural Perspectives. Um, and uh, another called Healing Traditions, the Mental Health of Aboriginal Peoples in Canada. He's received numerous awards from many organizations. Uh, I'll just mention that he uh, has received both the Creative Scholarship and Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Society for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture. I don't know, you still seem to be kicking, Lawrence. Uh, you've, you've already received the Lifetime Achievement. That was a weird experience. Well, maybe, maybe they see him yeah, on the that's like, that's like the kiss of death at that point. He's like, already qualified for that uh, award. But it really is an honor. He's a very distinguished uh, uh, professor. He is uh, talking to us today about uh, the title of the paper is Revisioning Psychiatry, Cultural Phenomenology, Critical Neuroscience, and Global Mental Health. So, Lawrence, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thanks. It's, it's really a privilege to be here among so many friends and uh, close colleagues and uh, to share some ideas. As Doug mentioned, this uh, uh, talk is sponsored by the Foundation for Psychocultural Research, and I've been privileged to be able to be uh, part of the activities of the Foundation for uh, uh, many years now. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today comes directly out of that work, uh, out of uh, some preoccupations in my own work as a clinician and researcher uh, doing work in various settings, uh, both in North America and internationally, and uh, out of a conference that was held uh, a couple of years ago by the uh, Foundation for Psychocultural Research, bringing together people working in different aspects of psychiatry and mental health to raise some uh, questions about how uh, to think properly about the role of neuroscience and the role of culture and context in mental health problems. Uh, and what I'd like to do today with you is to sketch out some of the conceptual problems that I think persist uh, in our work and in the configuration of mental health theory and practice, and to suggest some ways forward that I think lay out uh, a very important role for social scientists, for ethnography, and for a different kind of neuroscience uh, that was, it will be based on a kind of critique of some of the assumptions of neuroscience but that then would embrace a much more systemic way of thinking uh, about neuroscience, understanding that our brains are fundamentally the organs of culture, uh, that they are uh, the, um, the medium that we have for making sense of the social world, for carrying aspects of it with us, and for responding to, de to the demands of the, the predicament, social predicaments we find ourselves in. And that vision of what um, a human experience is uh, has important implica implications for how we might think of psychiatry and what mental health disciplines more generally ought to be about. So that's the, uh, <clears throat> the set of concerns that I have, and I'll try to lay that out more specifically. So here's really the... Um, the set of questions and the set of uh, issues that I'd like to, to raise with you. Um, and it, it speaks to the subtitle in my talk, really, uh, in terms of these three components, first of all. 
how should we think about the phenomenology of mental disorders, mental health problems? What are their constituent elements at an experiential level, at a behavioral level? Um, that's mostly given to us nowadays through official psychiatric nosology, but as we'll talk about, there are many dilemmas posed by that because that's a, a rather narrow lens, a rather rigid framework to put in the wide range of problems that we're concerned with. Uh, the second set of issues have to do with how shall we think about the role of the brain in explaining those things. There's a very strong tendency nowadays to think that the uh, explanations will begin and end with the brain. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from John Blofeld, a Buddhist scholar years ago, that goes something like, the long road begins and ends within the human skull. Uh, and what I want to suggest is in between it travels somewhere else, outside the human skull, and we need to be concerned at, at where the road is traversing in, in, on that route. Uh, and then finally to talk about the larger global implications, uh, essentially political economic implications, of claiming that we have the answers for uh, great swaths of human suffering and trying to export those answers to every corner of the world uh, as is embodied in a sort of movement for global mental health and just international psychiatry and uh, mental health disciplines in general. Uh, having posed those three questions, I just want to sort of Again, by way of summary, and the advantage of this is that since I'll probably go off in a very crooked direction through this talk, I'll have gotten all the key points out on the table from the very beginning, so then I can relax, you can relax, have some more wine, we'll be fine. Uh, and so uh, the three issues I just raised have answers ready to hand from uh, discipline. Psychiatry itself, and particularly biomedical psychiatry, uh, says we already have the answers to these. Phenomenology, that is to say the the experiential and ob observable characteristics of mental disorders are dictated by neurobiology. Uh, the better we understand the neurobiology, the better we'll understand the symptoms that people uh, uh, talk about. Uh, that pathobiology can com be completely understood in neurophysiological terms, that is to say, uh, within the confines of the brain and the circuitry of the brain. Uh, and therefore, the treatment of mental disorders will be largely mapped and dictated by our understanding of neuroscience. And I'll show you, lest you think I'm creating a straw man or an overly narrow view of psychiatry, I'll show you some um, quotations from august members of the discipline uh, who essentially make those claims in a very unequivocal way. There's an opposing view, to some degree I call it opposing, I guess an alternate view uh, from social science that says that phenomenology, the texture of experience, arises uh, from uh, lived experience, from developmental trajectories, from the social context and local worlds that people uh, live in and participate in. That pathology, human problems, arise at least in part from how people interpret their worlds and how others interpret their behavior in their worlds. Uh, and that therefore changes in how we interpret the world and how we respond to each other will have profound impacts on our well-being and on our functioning. Um, to me this is seems transparently true. It even, shouldn't even uh, require much argument. Uh, and it certainly is something that's very well elaborated within social sciences. But uh, increasingly within psychiatry, it's a bit of a hard sell uh, and viewed as something that's peripheral. And insofar as it's relevant to mental health, it's for other disciplines to deal with. Uh, so the social workers and the nurses and the uh, community care workers, they can pay attention to context. Uh, the psychiatrist's purview is uh, to focus in on these brain problems that will characterize and will intervene. So um, I'm, I guess I'm already revealing to you what my personal preoccupation uh, with this is. As somebody who came into psychiatry some decades ago, uh, hard for me to always get my head around that idea, but in any event, came into it as uh, being attracted to a discipline where uh, the idea was everything could be put together, all the different levels or facets or dimensions of human experience would be relevant. I now find myself in the midst of a, a, a discipline and a practice that is being reconfigured and largely doing it to itself in this very narrow, uh, uh, very sort of one-dimensional way. And I feel a strong need to push back against that on every front, uh, <laughs> theoretically, empirically, and, and pragmatically. So that's, I've sort of confessed to you now my underlying biases and motivation, why I'm interested in these issues. And I'll try to lay out in some ways why there's something more than a personal preoccupation and why, as I say, it's not just a straw man that I'm critiquing, but uh, real dilemmas that we face in the nature of our healthcare system, the nature of psychiatric education. And I say psychiatry, but I mean psychology and all the mental health disciplines uh, because we're part of the same sort of um, ecosystem of, of knowledge and of practice and influence each other very strongly. So the first point to be made is that although phenomenology has had uh, a rather broad and deep meaning, 
uh, within uh, European uh, continental philosophy and within the early roots of uh, psychiatry and the work of Karl Jaspers, very notably, and, and a tradition that continues up to today, mainly in Germany and a few other places in, in, in Europe, uh, in the process of uh, clarifying and revitalizing and re-institutionalizing uh, psychiatry in the last uh, 30 to 40 years that really uh, took place around the signal event of the launching of DSM-3, the notion of phenomenology was given a much narrower and more limited uh, view. And in fact, what happened was instead of phenomenology having something to do with how we understand the underlying nature or structure of experience in some ways, and using our own uh, reflection on our experience and each other's experience to try to get a sense of what that underlying structure is, uh, phenomenology came to mean uh, a list of symptoms, signs, and behaviors. Uh, that is the diagnostic criteria for mental disorders that are enshrined in official nosologies like DSM-4, soon to be 5, uh, and ICD-10, soon to be 11. Uh, and so we have this shift in meaning, uh, really, in what phenomenology means, because the word is actually used within psychiatry, but it's used to mean exactly these lists now of symptoms, uh, symptom criteria. And this is a rather radical uh, transformation, you could even say evisceration, of the idea of, of phenomenology. Ironically enough, uh, one of the people who uh, herself was in many ways a contributor to this process, a former editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, someone with a background in English literature, so presumably very sensitive uh, to the narrative structure of experience and so on, but who became very involved in uh, basic uh, research in schizophrenia and understanding the dimensions of uh, psychotic experience, uh, Nancy Adreason, was ultimately led to uh, um, decry exactly this shift that I'm talking about and talk about how somehow through exactly this process that I've just mentioned, uh, the meaning of phenomenology shifted and no one's very interested anymore uh, in phenomenology. Uh, within American psychiatry, at least. We recently in, in Montreal had um, a visit from uh, Joseph Parnas, a, a psychiatrist from um, uh, Copenhagen, uh, who's uh, very intensively involved in studying the phenomenology of psychosis using new tools uh, and trying to get at uh, a richer sense of experience and making the argument, as I will make as we go along, that you cannot do biological research without having a clear sense of the real phenomenology of disorders because you can't characterize the phenotype in any coherent way. That is, you can't group people into meaningful, coherent groups unless you have uh, a sophisticated uh, sense of what the nature is of their suffering. So uh, so one of the first set of concerns then is sort of what's become a phenomenology and where should we look for phenomenology? Now, as I mentioned, one of the arguments from uh, uh, mainstream biological psychiatry at this point is we don't have to look very far because there's going to be a simple relationship between uh, the broken machinery of the brain and specific symptoms that people will have. Uh, so there is going to be a kind of neurophenomenology uh, in which um, the workings of the nervous system will lead very naturally to a series of, uh, of problems. And you can certainly do uh, great work along these lines and even quite phenomenological work, I think, of the popular work of um, Oliver Sacks as an example of someone who looks in a more fine-grained way at the experience of losing the innervation to your leg or having a particular kind of brain injury and all the complex ramifications that unfold from that. And that kind of information uh, could sustain a kind of very rich neurophenomenology. And this is just a list of some of the areas where we can find traces of the impact of the structure and function of the brain in the quality of experience. And I'll, I, I'm not going to have time to go through any of these examples in depth, but let me just take the very first one, visual phosphenes. Um, years ago, Heinrich Kluver wrote a book called Mezcal and the uh, Mechanisms of Hallucinations, and the cover had an image very much like this in which I uh, pointed out that if you put uh, mild pressure on your eyeballs, and uh, the, how much pressure you put depends on how much wine you just had, I would say be very careful. If you, in any event, if you put a little bit of pressure on your eyes, uh, you will see a pattern uh, like this. And what is happening is you're seeing a kind of interference pattern uh, that is occurring in the first layers of the visual system. So in effect, you're seeing a kind of structure emerge from a crude stimulus that you're putting on an underlying structured neurological system. So you could say there's a, a very rudimentary form of neurophenomenology. Uh, and so the argument is these things exist in all kinds of ways, all kinds of subtle ways. And these are the raw materials out of which more complicated experiences uh, get built up, the kind of um, uh, um, 
uh, resonances or kind of patterns that are available within the nervous system, some of which are functional, some of which are incidental to uh, the structure of the nervous system. Here's a second example I had. This is a famous painting by Fuseli called The Nightmare. Uh, you see the nightmare sitting on the chest of the woman who's a, kind of in a swoon. Many people have interpreted this as being a picture actually of sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis, as you may know, is a sleep disorder in which a person wakes from REM sleep so that they become uh, awake and conscious, but maintains that component of REM sleep in which you have muscle paralysis. Uh, many people have, will have a sporadic episode of this in their life. I've had at least one episode I can recall vividly. Uh, and it's a very disturbing experience because you awake, uh, but you're paralyzed. Uh, and so it leads to a lot of immediate elaboration of experience. It's a very compelling experience. You could say, again, the rudiments of this experience are given by your nervous system. Your nervous system has put you in a situation of being alert but being paralyzed. And this then gets elaborated. But that's the key point, that it turns out that what you actually experience depends a great deal on your cultural background and how you interpret this. Uh, and some years ago, in the journal I edited, Transcultural Psychiatry published a, an issue, a guest edited by Devin Hinton and David Hufford, that brought together ethnographic accounts of sleep paralysis from different traditions. And people report quite different things. Inuit in the Arctic, an area where I've done a bunch of work, uh, often report a feeling of being outside your body and watching it from outside. And that fits with a cultural ontology that says that one aspect of the person's uh, soul or essence is detachable and can move around. And so that model fits then with the kind of pattern experience people have of this out-of-body experience, which is not hard to have uh, imaginatively for many people, but it's a characteristic experience of this kind of sleep paralysis among the Inuit. Um, Devon himself describes experience among uh, people from Cambodia who visualize uh, Buddhist demons uh, in the periphery of their vision, kind of coming at them in the dark. So you see an interplay, even in the first few seconds of making sense of this strange experience of cultural history, cultural shaping, personal knowledge, uh, forming a kind of loop. So what it implies is that for the most part, in any real experience that anybody has and narrates and shares uh, in a clinical or other context, we're not just dealing with neurophenomenology. Uh, we're dealing with interaction between things that the nervous system partially structures or patterns and that we immediately begin to make sense of uh, uh, through our own knowledge, our own memories, and our interactions with others. So in a sense, what we need is what we could call a kind of cultural neurophenomenology. That is, we need to understand how these potential experiences are elaborated over time, elaborated over just seconds of time as we begin to as self-interpreting beings begin to make sense of experience and how that feeds back into our experience in ways that then uh, makes a difference. Incidentally, uh, sleep paralysis is sometimes a clinical problem. People may have it frequently if their sleep is disrupted a lot. And one of the interventions is simply to explain it to people uh, because it's very disturbing. If you know what it is uh, and you can remember what it is when you wake up, it's going to be a lot less frightening. You just wait for it to subside and, and, and uh, that will be that. So. The cultural interpretations we have available are very important. And just as yet another side in that same issue of transcultural psychiatry, uh, uh, Richard McNally, a psychologist at Harvard, uh, has a uh, fascinating paper in which he argues that the not infrequent experience in the United States of alien abduction uh, may actually be related to uh, sleep paralysis in the sense that people have a very compelling experience, which is not well talked about culturally. Most people don't know much about sleep paralysis unless they've read some popular magazine that ran an article recently about you know, strange experiences. Uh, so people have had a very compelling uh, experience and then search around for something to make sense of it. And uh, you know, alien abduction in certain subcultures or contexts becomes a plausible explanation. And he argues that that is part of what's going on. And the very compelling nature of the bodily experience becomes part of the conviction somebody has that something really happened. You can't tell me I'm just making this stuff up. I had a very remarkable, very disturbing experience. And you can flesh it out in that way. So just to say that if you want to look for exotic cultural phenomena, you don't have to look far from home and you can see that how this um, unusual experience is being shaped. So this notion of cultural phenomenology, neurophenomenology, uh, moves against the kind of very simple uh, semiotics that underlies biomedicine, where the assumption is 
there's something that happens in the body and there's an experience or a behavior or a report that is indexical in some way. That is to say, it's just like if you have an infection, uh, you have um, things that happen that raise your temperature, we can go and take your temperature. It has nothing to do with what you think or what you do. It's just an index of the fact that you have an infection. Well, most symptom experience is not like that. It's embedded in interpretive processes that, as I say, are ongoing. And those processes are not only cognitive and internal to the individual, the way they would be studied in psychology, but they're also social. That is, they're embedded in relationships, intimate relationships, larger community relationships, our consumption interactions with mass media, and so on. So the linear connection between something is happening in your body or your brain, and you're now having the symptom, needs to be um, embedded in a much richer understanding of where the, that emergent experience is coming from. And we have some tools to study that. I've already alluded to the fact that in the psychology laboratory and in experimental settings, you can show the impact of cognition and how people attend to their body and how they interpret symptoms. And you can show this kind of thing likewise on a social level. The implication is that the cultural world, that is our developmental experience living in families and communities and the life context we find ourselves in, is constantly exerting an effect on ourselves. And the argument here is, just again, I, you, I apologize for the compression with, it, with which all of this argument will be presented to you today, but I want to cover this broad arc of, of the argument. Um, the social and cultural world is shaping us and shaping our nervous system at many levels. Uh, and not only in these interpretive processes that we could view as a kind of software of the mind, a kind of uh, programming, if you will, but um, at a phylogenetic level in terms of co-evolutionary processes by which we have become social beings of a certain kind and have propensities to uh, relate to each other in certain ways. I'll say a little bit more about that later. By epigenetic processes by which the, our life experience is turning on and off different aspects of the genome and so um, uh, altering our neural circuitry and the way we process things. We're starting to know a fair bit about that. Uh, by biographical processes by which we construct a narrative that makes sense of our lives and use that to regulate our own mem memory and our own self-presentation and by social contextual institutional processes uh, by which we occupy social space. So the idea that we have culture shaping the brain, if you will, constructing the brain even, can be given many different meanings on these different time scales and in these different uh, contexts and they all can be given uh, at least the rudimentary accounts at this point with um, uh, solid work uh, behind them. So it's more than just a sort of uh, promissory note about how we're going to develop a richer theory. Uh, I've been particularly interested in one set of processes that I think are absolutely central to most of our complex uh, thinking and acting, and that is the use of metaphor, originally inspired by the work of George Lakoff and others looking at the central role of metaphor in cognition. Uh, and arguing that semantic processes are the way to get at uh, thinking about language much more than grammar per se, that, that we get more to the, the meat of what language is about by trying to understand semantic processes. And the idea that what happens in metaphoric constructions, which is to say most of our language, uh, is that we draw from this phenomenology, this uh, cultural neurophenomenology of uh, early development of uh, uh, developing language that speaks to those basic bodily experiences and that those get elaborated over time in lo larger cultural forms and that we operate somewhere in the middle uh, in this interplay between these embodied uh, bodily grounded uh, kinds of um, notions uh, and uh, larger narrative forms uh, that culture is giving us. So this is a way to get at the language of suffering and the way people narrate their distress that doesn't try to assimilate it simply to, oh, you mentioned hallucinations, we'll check that off, that must mean the hallucination part of the brain isn't working, uh, but instead treats it as an attempt to describe something that is situated between some uh, bodily experiences that may be more or less uh, obdurate and, or preformed uh, before you articulate them, some of which may be more inchoate and more unclear uh, on the one hand, so those bodily experiences on the one hand, and the larger cultural narratives or templates where someone tells you already, this is the kind of thing that's happening to you. Here's how you should understand that. Oh, you heard a voice. Maybe that's a god or a spirit talking to you. I mean, that sets in motion, obviously, a whole lot of elaborate possibilities for making sense of what that experience is uh, that has uh, relevance uh, for you 
how that's going to unfold over time. And the idea then is that these individual experiences that we're all participating in all the time are contributing to a shared fund of knowledge about suffering. Now this, I mean, I, again, I apologize for the uh, putting a lot of things in play at once, but I want to argue that this is a much more realistic picture of what it means to describe a symptom uh, than the underlying medical semiotics that says, you know, you're either a good historian or not. If you're a good historian, you describe a symptom accurately, which means it maps very directly onto some underlying physiological process. If you're a poor historian, you embroider and you distort and so on. And instead, this says, look, there's a lot happening between whatever else might be happening in your body, and it has a lot of roots. It has roots in your biography. It has roots in the social world around you. And we need somehow to unpack some of those to understand what's going on for you, what's at stake for you, and how it relates to other people around you. It turns out in psychiatry that we already have a fair bit of evidence that that kind of interpretive process is not only shaping how people express distress, so that there are fairly wide variations around the world in terms of how people talk about suffering, but it has implications because it feeds back into how you manage uh, your predicament, it has implications for the course and outcome of most um, problems, health problems in general, mental health problems certainly. Um, and I'll give you one brief example of how this kind of cultural neurophenomenology can go forward by taking advantage of different realms of, of uh, scholarly work, of reflection on things, and I'll use just here the pivotal metaphor of face. As you probably know, a uh, face is something that is an important word in various languages having to do with your social status and stature, uh, your honor, your value to other people, maintaining face, having good face, giving good face to people, managing uh, damage to your face in some ways, all met metaphorically about your social standing and your moral standing is central to many traditions. Uh, 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 it also turns out, from a neurological point of view for a moment, that a good chunk of our brain is devoted to decoding faces, to figuring out what's going on in faces. Uh, very, you know, specialized regions of the brain that are very, uh, a lot of uh, processing time is, is devoted to faces for a couple of reasons. One is that the face is the marker of emotion, and that's why we have the particular facial features that we probably have in good part, is to communicate lots of emotional information to each other. Uh, and we're good at reading that off people, and also to communicate individuality. We recognize people as who they are, as a person with a particular history or with whom we have a particular kind of relationship. Uh, it turns out that those parts of the brain are different. They're separable. You can have injuries to one or the other, in which case you can have a situation where you recognize the person, but nothing feels emotionally proper about them. And so you may become convinced that there's something wrong, that maybe this person is an imposter. They look just like uh, your mother, but they can't possibly be your mother because it doesn't feel right how you're, you're, you're decoding that person's emotional expression. And you can have the opposite effect. You can have a situation where you understand perfectly well the emotional communication, but you don't recognize the person at all. Uh, and so uh, it just speaks to the idea that there is a neurology underlying this and there's a neurophenomenology of distortions of uh, face processing and understanding, but there's this higher level social use that's being made of the idea of face and the argument I'm making is that these two things are not unrelated. In other words, the metaphors of face are not accidental. There's a reason why face is so central to our conceptions of the social world and to where we sit vis-a-vis -vis others in the social world and that we can study then in an ethnographic way and, and in the laboratory as well the looping effects between these embodied aspects of meaning that have to do with neurological processes and the particular social meanings that are given in different contexts. And lest you, uh, just to punctuate this dry uh, abstract talk, give you a momentary compelling experience of face, it's pretty hard not to look at this and to begin to smile, to begin to feel maternal and paternal feelings and, and feel very, very strong things being activated in you. So that's what I mean a little bit about the neurophenomenology. But of course, it's not just neurophonology, because in the instant you're having all kinds of thoughts again about what do children mean, what do these children mean to you, what associations do you have, and so on. These are two children from Tengan Tenganan in, in, in Bali. Um, and finally, this image, another nice face, but a very uh, different uh, set of meanings, the uh, phenomenological philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who argued that ethics begins with the face of the other. And this is a, an interesting move in European phenomenology, a, a move deliberately against Heidegger to try to put back into play some kind of accountability to the other to avoid exactly the kind of obliteration of the other that um, Heidegger and other people were uh, part and parcel to. And so 
and Levinas is using the notion of face fairly abstractly, but it is not, just like the way I talk about these metaphors, it's not ungrounded in the reality of uh, our first experiences in infancy of looking up perhaps at the face of a parent and of the emotional communication that comes to us uh, through the notion of face. So just to say that there's a lot of work that can be done then in working back and forth across these levels of description in a way that I think could inform much more richly a kind of psychiatric, psychological phenomenology of experience, of ordinary experience and of suffering. What this would lead to is a kind of notion, a kind of recognition of how we make sense of other people. So in the middle, as you know, those of you who are mental health practitioners know that we, we put a lot of store in the notion of empathy. And some years ago, uh, Doug Holland and uh, Jason Troop organized a, a very interesting meeting on uh, issues of empathy and ethnography, and there've been uh, it's been a hot topic in many fields in recent years. Uh, and in mental health, there's this notion that somehow empathy gives you privileged access to another person's experience. You can somehow tune in and you can have a kind of parallel experience that gives you a depth of understanding and feeling of what another person is feeling. And a lot of training in psychotherapy is really learning how to regulate that process so you don't get under-distant or over-distant, that you're not uh, overwhelmed by what's going on, you're not mistaking your own reactions for the other person's uh, process and so on, but you're making use of that human capacity we have that in fact has been studied again in the psychology laboratory in different ways as the chameleon effect. If you sit with someone and listen very closely, uh, you will begin to synchronize your movements with that person, you'll synchronize your breathing with them, and you'll have various other kinds of experiences like that. Uh, and so there's something going on there that we can call empathy. In mental health practice, we often work with people, though, where we may reach the limits of empathy. They have extreme and odd experiences, and they're sometimes hard to understand. We may not have had that kind of experience. We may not have been tortured. We may not have had a kind of abuse. We may not have had a kind of psychotic experience someone else has had. Or we may just be afraid to go there. We may have had glimpses of it, and it's just not comfortable to go there. So we have ways of managing that with abstract conceptual models. We have theories of what's going on. Uh, I'm working with someone and um, I, uh, I fail to empathize with them and they tell me that they feel like a, a frog being dissected on the table and I feel like, whoa, that's kind of intense. So I have uh, a way of thinking about what, you know, what might be going on for this person that they would experience uh, that, to me, minor rupture in my ability to track them as something that was eviscerating them in some ways. Uh, so we have this whole way of using models of psychopathology to explain, oh, this person has problems in their attachment, they have problems with stability of representations, they're, you know, blah, 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 they're experiencing this kind of suffering. What I want to argue uh, from the social, uh, cultural point of view is there's another kind of knowledge uh, that we're using all the time tacitly, but that we need to use more explicitly. And that is understanding the person's life experience in its social context, in the social world. And typically in psychiatry, that has been left out because it's just taken for granted. In fact, it's just treated as the commonsensical background to an encounter. It's not that people don't use it. They use their own life experience and their own norms constantly as a tacit measure by which to decide, is this experience odd? Is this person normal or not? And so on. Uh, but when you work cross-culturally, that gets thrown into relief right away because some of the things that you're taking for granted and viewing as just common sense don't work the same way for other people. And if you don't have that other uh, language and way of thinking about context, you're thrust back into, the, into these other realms. So you think either it's a failure of empathy, that there's something wrong with me or them that we're not attuned, or there's an issue of trust or something, or it's a kind of pathology, there's something wrong with that person. So we're missing a third or more of what we need to contextualize problems if we don't take the social world into account systematically in some way. That's the first part of my talk. I don't know how we're doing for time here. I've got three chunks, so there's chunk one. Uh, chunk two, so that's what I have to say for the moment about phenomenology. I hope we'll have time to come back and we will discuss these things together. Have I lost my uh, it's connection? It's rubbing. I, uh, maybe on the po uh, pocket? Or? I'm only, only going to get more animated. It's only going to rub more. So <laughs> Okay. Oh. Um, the second part of what I want to talk about uh, comes from a slightly different perspective. All the things I'll have to say have come from a kind of cultural perspective on psychiatry and mental health, but this is now a different lens. Uh, and this is, I'm representing this now by a book by uh, a colleague, uh, two colleagues, Suparna Chowdhury and Jan Slaby, who recently published a book on critical neuroscience, and in fact, this is also based on a conference that was held here a couple of years ago, as well as some conferences we had at McGill and in Berlin. 
uh, of a, a group of people. Suparna is a, a developmental, uh, a cognitive developmental neuroscientist, and Jan Slabi is a philosopher. And what they're concerned with is how to apply the perspectives of philosophy and social sciences to thinking about how neuroscience and research in neuroscience constructs its object. So this is a very contemporary view that is not just uh, um, let's look at cultural differences in the brain, but let's look in cultural differences in how neuroscientists think about the brain. And let's look at neuroscience itself as a kind of subculture uh, that is, has particular rituals and practices and knowledge uh, that then gets put into play in the larger culture. Uh, so these are, it's not just that they're doing esoteric work off in uh, the ivory tower, but this is very much part and parcel of our everyday languages uh, of the self. So they've uh, proposed a kind of uh, umbrella under which to bring together a variety of different kinds of activities from sociology, anthropology, philosophy, and so on, ethics. Uh, and it's a little bit different. There has been a, a fairly active field in the last five to ten years or more of neuroethics, where people have been very concerned about the ethical implications of new technologies, brain stimulation, uh, psychopharmacology, uh, psychosurgery, so on and so forth, things that have rather portentous uh, uh, implications, so there's been a lot of interest in thinking these through. This is a, a broader discussion because it's uh, saying ethical issues aside or, or before the ethical issues. These are just uh, part and parcel of how we're framing uh, our, our sense of self and our social worlds in the first place, so we need to have discussion about that as well. And these are some of the uh, um, motivations behind it. And in particular, I should say it's intended, even though the word critique is in the title, some people like the word critique and some people cringe at the word critique, uh, the point is not critique in a, in a destructive sense at all. I mean, you know, to critique something is also to honor it, to take it very seriously, and to look at it uh, with some discriminating wisdom, I guess the, the, the Buddhists would say. So uh, that's really the goal, because the people involved are interested in neuroscience and very excited about it, as many of us are, but see dilemmas in the ways in which uh, folk psychology, folk neurology get brought into neuroscience, motivate experiments, and these things then feed back into our popular culture. So we've got a kind of, uh, again, a kind of circulation of ideas that maybe occurs uh, non-critically at times. And so the idea is to be able to locate neuroscience in its context, uh, broader social context, and use that to think through what's being claimed uh, and, and how best to understand that, and maybe how to design better experiments in the long run that take into account various meanings of, of um, uh, culture and context. Why is this important for psychiatry? Uh, well, because of this kind of popular writing. I'm, uh, um, another book by An Nancy Adresen from an earlier incarnation, I guess, uh, that really promotes what is a very popular notion now in, in our culture at large, uh, which is that there are certain kinds of problems, and I don't, by, I don't mean strokes and uh, things that where people would agree, yes, that's a, a direct insult to the neural machinery, but certain kinds of subtler, more complex problems that can fundamentally be understood as broken brains. Uh, and that extends not just to pathology, but of course to everyday life. Uh, that uh, you know the reason that you eat too much or buy too many things or, or uh, vote for this party or that party and so on is all really explainable in some sense uh, by your brain, that we're going to tell you what's really going on in terms of your brain. So there's some concern that these kind, this style of explanation uh, overreaches in some ways or distorts the story, even though it may be based on bits and pieces of, of knowledge that are you know, important, relevant, interesting. And within psychiatry, this has a very far reach. Uh, this is a paper from a few years ago now in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, by Tom Insull, who's still the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, and by his then uh, counterpart in Canada, Remy Kirion, neuroscientist who studies uh, Alzheimer's disease, among other things. And in this article, these two heads of these two uh, countries' uh, top-level uh, research funding uh, organizations are describing their vision of psychiatry of the future. And psychiatry of the future will be, they say, applied, clinically applied neuroscience. And what they mean by clinically applied neuroscience is it will use genetics and it will use brain imaging to diagnose and then various allied technologies to intervene. And that's going to be, that's the goal that we're marching toward and in effect that will be the end point. Now again, as a clinician reading this, find it deeply troubling uh, and find it a, a very narrow vision and a very striking vision in a context, again, in, a, in the U.S. context of a country which for a hundred years was famous for its environmentalism, 
going back to the earlier, not the DNA Watson, but the earlier Watson, uh, who uh, talked about, uh, you know, uh, give me a child from whatever background and I'll give him a certain upbringing and he can become anything. And these, this was a, a central, not just a, a claim within psychology, but arguably a central ideological uh, pillar of, uh, of U.S. society. And it's very striking to see a kind of shift that's occurred in the last 20, 30 years uh, toward a kind of biological determinism uh, in people's lives and how much at play this is uh, in many venues, including in uh, the people who set the research agenda for psychiatry uh, and mental health more broadly and how they want to frame uh, human problems. Uh, so um, you may know that uh, DSM-5 is about to, to come out uh, in a, a few months and uh, uh, the galley proofs are circulating. People are crossing the T's and dotting the I's right now or sometimes trying to do more radical last minute things. Um, in any event, uh, there was originally a hope that uh, some 10, 15 years ago when DS, DSM-5 was just a glimmer in people's eyes, uh, that this would be a radical revision of psychiatric nosology that would be founded on new neurobiology, that we would have so much good neuro neuroscience that we could restructure the whole way we divide up mental health problems and it would reflect a deeper understanding of the actual underlying mechanisms. And uh, there were all kinds of, uh, again, anticipation that we would shift toward a dimensional view of human problems because the biology tells us that many things, levels of anxiety or uh, feelings of suspiciousness or anything else you might think of, tend to exist on a kind of continuum and we could somehow have models that showed how those continue to interact and sometimes give rise to uh, uh, problems that blow up for people. And we would end up with a very different kind of, of nosology. It's turned out that, in fact, we have a very conservative revision in DSM-5, very few changes, very small changes. And some of the areas where people thought there were going to be radical changes have kind of uh, uh, fallen by the wayside in the end, largely because uh, the neuroscience is just not there. The, the neuroscience that people had hoped would, would provide the guide is just as much as there's fantastic new knowledge, it does not shed a lot of light on the everyday problems that most clinicians are, are working with. So there's still a long way to go before we have a, a radically revision vision view, and I've already given you some reasons to think and will give you more, I hope, for why that will never quite be the case, that it will never be sufficient uh, to simply give a neurological account to have a good list of common human problems and their solutions. The two will, will never map one-to-one um, -one onto each other. In any event, because of the failure of DSM-5 to revision uh, itself as a biological uh, a classification, uh, NIMH decided to go its own way and develop the RDOX criteria, th that is criteria that are rooted in what are considered the uh, ongoing kinds of frameworks and cutting edge issues in neurobiology uh, that could be used to structure uh, mental health research. And so the primary focus in RDOX is on neural circuitry. Uh, that we're going to identify the neural circuits. There was one of the books toward DSM-5 was called uh, Fear Circuitry Disorders. Uh, that was the hope that we were going to have, we wouldn't have anxiety disorders anymore, we'd have fear circuitry disorders. Then people realize, well, we're, again, we're not quite there yet, so we're not going to have fear circuitry disorders as far as I know. Um, but that was the, the kind of hope, and this is how this thing is being configured, and this is one of the uh, attempts to sort of show what this kind of grid looks like. Uh, and you see uh, across the top, Levels of analysis, genes, molecules, cells, circuits, physiology, behavior, self-reports, and paradigms. Uh, and then uh, on the, um, the rows, the different kinds of constructs where the feeling was there's enough good science at this point that we can do meaningful work in this area and there should be research put into it. So I think this is a fascinating vision and it maps well onto some aspects of research. From the point of view, again, of a clinician or someone who's more socially oriented, it seems a bit skewed. It seems like certain things are well elaborated and there's a few different uh, aspects of them and other things are just being lumped into one huge category and we don't have the same level of refinement. So that's kind of the concern here. Not that there's something wrong with trying to make these distinctions and look at things in multi-levels and approach things as systems and problems, or as circuitry, systems, interactive processes. It's fascinating. I'll argue again as we go along that that's definitely the way to go in the long run, uh, but whether whether this is a, a comprehensive or integrative picture or really just let's go where the money is or where the money already has gone uh, rather than uh, a more balanced integrated picture is I think what's, what's of concern. And here's one of the reasons for why that's of concern. Um, this is just a, a diagram showing uh, the involvement of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex 
in 37 behavioral domains. When you read neuroimaging studies, you will see, oh, this part of the brain is involved. We know it's involved with uh, the self, the self-judgments. We know this is involved with executive functions. We know this is involved with whatever. Well, the same parts of the brain are involved with many different things because the brain is not, despite the sort of neophrenology of talking about different parts of the brain, the brain is not simply, uh, you know, a bunch of little highly specialized uh, regions, it is a bunch of circuits and circuits that are put to many different uses depending upon the context we find ourselves in. So figuring out what that circuitry, what use the circuitry is being put to demands a, a social understanding of what is it we're being asked to do. I mean, we have, we have a category of mental health problems now of learning disabilities and people can have a, a specific reading disorder. Uh, we did, the brain did not evolve as far as we know in any reasonable time span to be able to read. Read is something we came up with not all that long ago, and now it matters a huge amount in your life. And in fact, in some people's lifetimes it matters. They go from living in a rural community to living in an urban community. Fifty years ago, my predecessor, McGill Ray Prince, described brain fag syndrome in Nigeria among uh, young people who were the first in their families to become literate. And we're moving from villages in, in Nigeria to the big city and forced to read all the time to get ahead in this colonial education system and complained of brain fag, that their brain was just getting exhausted and overwhelmed from all this unnatural work that they had to do uh, to get ahead. So uh, that is a new phenomenon. It's a social phenomenon. It has physiological consequences. It involves putting to use circuits that were evolved presumably for very different or very general purposes to a very specific, very demanding function. And we can raise questions as to what will happen over time now that we're using our brains in whole new ways as a result of uh, you know, mobile technology and so on. Um, the models we have of the brain, and one of the concerns of critical neuroscience is to understand the languages that we use for talking and thinking about the brain. The models that we have are part not only of professional knowledge but of popular culture. So this is a um, little plastic wall hanging, a colorful poster in the office of a psychiatrist in some part of the world I won't name. Actually, you could probably figure it out by looking at the lower <laughs> right-hand uh, part of it. Um, and uh, this uh, communicates to the psychiatrist and to all of uh, his or her patients who come into the room a very particular model of the nature of depression, which is that depression has to do with serotonergic synapses and the activity in those synapses. Now we know that the neurobiology is probably much more complicated than that, that that is a, a gross oversimplification and our hopes that that would give us a kind of simple, uh, again, neo-humoral theory that, you know, you have too much or too little serotonin, too little serotonin is depression, too much is resilience, you know, that we'd have some kind of simple model like that, that that's just not going to quite work that way as far as we understand, but that does not prevent uh, the pharmaceutical companies from uh, promoting this idea as a simple way to convey uh, how these things work. I remember years ago going to an American Psychiatric Association meeting in San Francisco and there was a booth uh, there on virtual reality that at the moment was being hosted by Jared Lanier, the found one of the key people in the development of virtual reality, virtual technology, a guy who developed I think the Mattel Power Glove or something like this. He was a really cool guy. Uh, and he was doing this thing where psychiatrists could come and they could put on goggles and they could fly inside a synapse and see the molecules bouncing back and forth. And we're almost there. <laughs> So there is an idea here that uh, has a technical side, and there's a lot of good you know, animal research and good neuroscience on one end of this, and then there's a popular side of this that circulates where, oh, I know it's because of bad chemicals in the brain, it's because of an imbalance, it, maybe it's because of serotonin, oh, serotonin's also present, or tryptophan's there in my turkey dinner, I'll get more, more serotonin, and so on. So this stuff circulates popularly. And we need to understand how that is reshaping ourselves. Nicholas Rose and other people have been writing about the neurochemical self, the idea that we really have new ways of narrating our experience. And you probably know we've done some work on the use of uh, psychopharmaceuticals among uh, adolescents and young people. You probably know on this campus there's an enormous number of young people who are using all kinds of medications as performance enhancers with a kind of model of this that, well, I'll, I'll up this or I'll down that and I'll function better uh, as a result. So this is part of the popular notion of the brain as a discursive object. That is, we, we, are, we think about the way our nervous system works and we have ways of talking about it and that has taken the place to some degree for people of psychological language. Uh, Freudian psychology, which was a big uh, revelation, a new dispensation in the 
uh, 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, has become less of a revelation for many people. In fact, it's become part of popular psychology to a degree, uh, accurately or not. Uh, and what is uh, the newer language really is talking about the brain. And this is a paper from some years ago by, um, uh, uh, or, uh, not, not so long ago, by a psychologist talking about, actually I think the date is wrong on that, I think it's 2006 actually, but anyway, talking about uh, the ways in which, uh, actually it's not just psychologists either, he's a neuroscientist, but this is a piece of psychological work in this sort of uh, George Lakoff kind of tradition, Lakoff and Johnson tradition of unpacking uh, the metaphoric models people are using and showing that people use the metaphor of the brain much as they, in the past, people use the metaphor of the mind. That the brain is where things happen and you want to explain what's happening in your life and justify it and so on, you can refer to the brain. And the anthropologist Fernando Vidal has also made the point that we now have not personhood but brainhood. Uh, and uh, brainhood is a more modern, more with it way to be uh, because it shows that you're knowledgeable and realistic about uh, who you are. But what your brainhood is populated by, of course, is popular neurology. It's not the, the nuanced and, and uh, tentative models that someone's constructing in the laboratory. It's these broad tropes of uh, what makes your brain work well and so on. Uh, Simon Cohn, a, a, a sociologist working in, in the UK, has done a fascinating study with people uh, he was originally uh, enjoined to help work on the problem of how, I, I think he was involved somehow in how to help recruit people for neuroimaging studies. So he became involved with talking with people uh, who had taken part in these studies. And he was amazed to find people who had mental health problems who would carry around the picture of their brain scan in their wallet. And would want to show it to people, say, you know, I have bipolar disorder. Look, you can see, you know, here. And there was a kind of reality to that brain image that transcended the complexities of trying to explain a, you know, a very unusual and complex problem that, that was somewhere in the murky zone between voluntary and involuntary behavior and so on. This really was a kind of reassuring anchor point uh, that validated the reality and that uh, dispelled all of the, the confusion about the problem. So it matters a lot what popular languages we're using uh, for the brain, and arguably even for neuroscientists it matters because like all scientists are also citizens and we're all working with both languages. We have technical languages, but we have the backdrop of common sense that's also motivating our thinking and that we're, we're using it. And it matters a lot what language we use. Now we have available other languages. We have available quite uh, rich languages, uh, some of which have to do with the nature of systemic processes rather than with... Um, sort of essentializing notions that just say there are certain characteristics of one thing or another and it's, it's there in the essence of it, we have more systemic notions. And I'm referring, this is a book by a, a sociologist of science, Andrew Pickering, who's worked on quantum uh, 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 the, uh, mechanics in the past. And here he's talking about this whole rich tradition uh, that largely took place in the UK and here around the cybernetic models of uh, the brain, of the nervous system, uh, and the people who are involved with that, Norbert Wiener, um, uh, uh, w. Ross Ashby, Warren McCulloch, other people who were very influential in developing these ideas, Walter Gray. What's interesting is uh, these models, which I think are quite rich, uh, have not penetrated to the same degree as the humoral models, or the very simplistic models. And that's probably just because they're not simple models. They're hard to grasp, and they're kind of counterintuitive. And you can see here from uh, Google Ngram View, or those of you who are interested in a cheap way of doing historical research, you know, Google has, uh, has uh, indexed a huge volume of literature. And you can now go look for the frequency of words in all this literature and actually look at the rise and fall of terminology. It doesn't mean much by itself, but when you put terms side by side, you begin to get a sense of what might be going on in cer certain kinds of discourse. So here you can see the rise and fall to some degree of cybernetics and the rise of networks. And uh, 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 Catherine Malibu has written a book um, about, um, called something like, What Should We Do With Our Brain? I think I'm, I'm maybe not remembering it correctly. But she argues very much that the notion of networks and plasticity of networks has become the dominant trope. And in fact, she suggests that it's because of neoliberal capitalism. It's because of the idea that not having one thing in charge and having things move around and being plastic is very much uh, the way we're being encouraged to think about our lives and think about our relationships with each other. I don't know if I would go that far, but I, I would say that there's certainly an interplay between the, the tropes that are available for us in thinking about the brain. So all of this is pointing toward what for me is the essential idea coming out of this kind of social science critique of how we're building models of the brain and models of the self. And this is the idea that the philosopher Ian Hacking has kind of uh, tried to encapsulate in the notion of what he calls the looping effect. Basically arguing that since we are self-interpreting beings, 
And since our interpretations of things become our reality, we have a kind of self-satisfying loop. Once we decide to describe our experience a certain way, it becomes our reality to a large degree, and we organize our lives and organize our institutions that way. So I don't have time to go into it here, but just to say that uh, 15, 20 years ago, Prozac, when Prozac came out in North America, became a big blockbuster drug. All the later SSRI antidepressants have been very popular. It was hardly used at all in Japan because there was no depression to treat in Japan. People didn't get depression. They had other things. Uh, and then after they, GlaxoSmithKline and other companies had saturated the Western market, they said, OK, it's time to get Japan. Um, interestingly, I should mention just as an aside, because again, it's like the Google Engram thing. You need a comparison point. Six months after Viagra came out, in North America, it was available in Japan. And in Japan, to market medications, you have to have your own clinical trial. So it was a project to get uh, Viagra there, but it, they knew it was a worthwhile project, and they did it. Antidepressants, not so, until they were running out of markets, and they said, OK, we'll strategize. And what they were able to do through manga, through popular education, through a whole variety of things, was to get people to re-describe uh, certain aspects of everyday human suffering as depression. And you have an exponential growth over a period of time in the uh, treatment, diagnosis and treatment of depression. So this is an aspect of what Ian Hacking has called the looping effect. That is, we're in the midst of all the time. It's happening all the time. It doesn't mean things are not real, but it means that how we interpret them is an important part of what they are and what they, what they mean to us. And we, we have to make sense of that. And this is just a picture of those loops, kind of. I'm afraid this is going to turn, uh, no, good. It didn't turn into a big animated thing. I have a, I'll show you another one in a moment. So the notion is, actually, I'll just stay with that for one second. The notion is that there's an internal set of loops that go on that have to do with how we notice what's going on in our own experience and interpret it, and that changes our experience. This is central, for example, to the cognitive behavioral theory of panic disorder or hypochondriasis. It essentially argues that there's a kind of uh, a bodily, emotional, cognitive loop that a person's going around. And it's exactly because that becomes a self-amplifying loop that you get into a big clinical problem. And if you can just interrupt that loop almost anywhere in the cycle, there should be some decrement then in the distress. So uh, in the straight ahead CBT uh, treatment, reattribution treatment of, of, of this kind of thing, people will simply be told, when you have that feeling, just tell yourself, it does not, this tightness in my chest does not mean I'm having a heart attack. And that will help. Saying that will help instead of saying, oh, maybe I'm having a heart attack, just doing it even deliberately without even believing it will still help because you're interrupting some of that cycle. So that's the kind of evidence that people bring forward to say these internal loops are important. They make a difference for people. Devin Hinton has done beautiful cross-cultural work showing how these loops can, the contents of them can be very culture-specific ideas about what things mean, sensations in the body, and so on. Um, there's also a, a larger set of loops that are between us in which people are telling you what they think is going on, or you're telling them and seeing whether they'll buy it or not. I mean, and those are also very important for stabilizing our experience. And of course, there are interactions between those loops. So that's, that would lead to, if we took all that seriously, that would lead to a, di a radically different kind of nosology in psychiatry in which what we would have is a typology of loops. So you say what really makes the problem is not just that a part of your brain is broken, uh, but that you're in some kind of a vicious circle. And those vicious circles can involve all kinds of things. They can be internal things and in how you're interpreting things. They can be interpersonal problems and so on. And we can, you know, we can study these and we can intervene in them. And I think family therapists and other people have been doing this for a long time. And it would be a shame if psychiatry loses that language and, uh, of a kind of larger catalog of human problems uh, for which there are meaningful interventions uh, and uh, they can uh, make a difference. This is the same kind of loop uh, with some uh, institutions named uh, on the outer circle. You see the American Psychiatric or American Psychological Association, if you want, uh, DSM, universities, practitioners, clinics, uh, big pharma. We have the inner loops, the person's figuring out what's going on. What is this feeling of fatigue? I mean, I got, uh, I mean, I have all kinds of compelling personal stories about this. When I had young children, I, there was a period where I was going uh, through. Um, coming home to play with my daughter on the floor. I would get on the kitchen floor and be playing with her, and I'd be too tired to get up off the floor. Uh, and I thought, something's really wrong, and I thought, I must be depressed. Uh, I mean, I have that schema is read, ready to hand for me. Uh, and eventually, I went to see my doctor, and, and he noticed that I was coughing all the time, and he said, you have asthma. So it never had occurred to me in a million years. So just to say, I mean, there are lots of 
things going on, real things are going on, depression, asthma, whatever, and we're trying to make sense of these things, and we make sense with the materials at hand. So that's the inner loop. The outer loop, of course, is uh, much more complicated, and there are many forces, just as there are internal forces that we don't lead us to not want to look at things. I, I'm psychologically minded, so I'm happy to say, oh, I'm depressed. I've had a patient for years who told me uh, he's convinced he had brain damage, and I said, but I think you're depressed. He said, oh, no, that's horrible. If, I have, if I'm depressed, I'm really finished. I'd much rather have brain damage. <laughs> It's operating with a different set of assumptions in it than I'm operating with, but it has the same effect in that what we're willing to look at, what we're not willing to look at based on, on those assumptions. But outside we have all these political economic issues that we're being encouraged to frame our problems in certain ways, and those are becoming our realities. That's what's available in our environment. So we need to be studying those as well. This gets a little over-animated here. Okay. The last part of the talk. We're, 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 sort of, we're sort of running out of time here. I'll do this more briefly. Uh, it, it follows from what I've been saying right now, which is to say we, we as a practitioner working in North America, we, we, work, we live in a very privileged part of the world. We have a lot of wealth, a lot of resources. Ironically, we have certain problems that come exactly out of that. I mean, we do not have the best health in the world or the greatest happiness in the world or so on, notwithstanding our wealth, and that has, some of that has to do with the nature of our lives. Uh, but we certainly feel uh, a sense of, of privilege and uh, an accident, what uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, legal theorist, uh, um, uh, I'm blocking on her first name now, Sakar has said it's called the birthright lottery, you know, that it's just an accident of birth where we're born. So we really ought to consider what things are like in other parts of the world. We maybe have a moral obligation to do something to, to address those things if we, if we really consider that it's an accident of birth, that we have it easier than some other people. Uh, and so part of the motivation behind that then has been a concern uh, to look at the huge disparities that exist around the globe in health and, as it turns out, in mental health. And as you know, for a long time in public health and gl in global health, mental health was pushed to one side as a lower priority because the attitude was, well, let's deal with malnutrition and infectious diseases, major infectious diseases, and which are killing people in droves. Once that's taken care of, sure, we, we can deal with other things. And then arguments were made uh, some time ago uh, that um, actually there's significant impact of mental health and these things interact. They're not really separable uh, and they, uh, if you want to even deal with these very basic issues of nutrition and, and, and infectious disease, you ought to be considering mental health at the same time. So now we have a movement for global mental health in which people are trying to address that. And that attitude of looking at the global issues uh, occurs against a backdrop of a globalizing economic system. And the globalizing economic system, of course, weaves us together in ways that allow all kinds of new transactions and circulation of knowledge, but that also, and, and that create new opportunities for people, but that also create new kinds of inequality, that also uh, accentuate inequality because those who have the power to control these uh, asymmetrical exchanges uh, can exploit uh, different parts of the world. So we ban certain medications here as dangerous, so they get sold in other places. I mean, when I was a medical student, this is what happened with chloramphenicol, I think, and it ended up being sold in Mexico because it wasn't safe to sell in Canada or the U.S. So we have many stories of this kind of thing going on. So we have real political and ethical issues on a global scale. Uh, and uh, it then matters how we think about these things. So I, I'm talking about it globally, but let me just bring it home. I decided I would give you a concrete example from closer to home because, again, there's a very strong temptation. If I talk about Canada, you know, the U.S., Canada is one of the most privileged countries in the world. We have it, you know, things are, are pretty good on a, on a global level. Uh, but, of course, it's not the same for everybody in Canada. So this is the suicide rate among um, Inuit in the Arctic of uh, the uh, people who used to be called the Eskimo in the Arctic of, of uh, Canada. And you see this growing rate and what in effect, I mean, this is a, a deaths per uh, 100,000, this is an astronomical uh, suicide rate in terms of uh, what it is ordinarily in, in uh, population. This is number of deaths, I'm sorry, it's not by 100,000. It is an astronomical rate. Uh, let's see, there's the rate by 100,000. So you see that the rate by 100,000 is up to 500 per 100,000. So this is an astronomical rate. And you see that it's occurring, it's something that's been occurring in recent years, been getting worse, and it's primarily young men. So here is a problem close to home. This is my own country. This is a wealthy country where there's, everybody's supposed to have access to comparable care and, and resources and a, a chance at things. And there's this enormous disparity that just cries out for an explanation. And the explanation uh, is not likely to be a simple biological explanation uh, in the sense that these are people who lived in their environment uh, for about 5,000 years. 
uh, in a cha challenging environment. As far as we know, they did not have a very high suicide rate or they wouldn't be here today because they were tiny communities of people, rather fragile communities. There were episodes of suicide as far as we know, but they were rare. They were strategic. They were done uh, often um, in... Uh, well, it's not even right to call it suicide. There are situations of self-sacrifice that people made, but this phenomenon of youth suicide is a completely new and strange phenomenon for Inuit. So we have to explain it in terms of the contemporary world and presumably the social forces that are impacting on people. Even though within a community, there may be individual psychological factors that help us understand why that person, we're not going to explain this whole population-wide trend without coming to grips with these larger social uh, things And if we ask what that story is, well, it's a story of state-organized violence against indigenous people. It wasn't always viewed as violence. It was viewed as helping them, as civilizing them, teaching them to be good Europeans uh, because they were primitive people who didn't have a valuable culture. Uh, and so we had in Canada for 100 years a residential school system, not unlike you had here, in which Inuit and other First Nations children were taken from their homes and put in re residential boarding schools, had restricted access to their families, uh, were uh, treated harshly, and with the, with the explicit message, and this is more for First Nations than Inuit in terms of the proportion of people and how they were affected, but there are other things at play as well. Uh, the basic message was, uh, you know, you don't use your language, don't, don't uh, learn about your culture, become a good Euro-Canadian. And we now know, um, for obvious reasons, attachment reasons, uh, identity reasons, uh, community reasons, uh, that this has had a serious effect. And if you try to trace what those, those impacts are, uh, you can see it operating on many different levels. You can understand it uh, as an individual process between how people relate to each other, uh, one to another, and the fact that if you're, uh, as a child, are in an uh, abusive institutional setting and you eventually have children of your own, uh, your response to those chi that child's needs is going to be affected probably by your own past experiences and your capacity uh, to respond. Uh, some of that probably has a biological substrate. We now know a little bit about that, um, thanks to the work of Michael Meany and Gustavo Tarecki and many other people. Uh, but the, in this case, this, this uh, political intervention or state intervention, we could say, had more than an individual level of process uh, because it was whole cohorts of children who were taken out of communities. And so families and communities and indeed peoples uh, were being disrupted and their, their sense of, of collective power is being disrupted. We now have in Canada a Truth and Reconciliation Commission ongoing right now in which the government has formally apologized for this uh, policy of forced assimilation in the residential schools uh, and some efforts at redress, but it's a complicated thing to reverse. Now this is not the whole story for Inuit youth, let's say, but this is the backdrop and some of the other things I listed are the backdrop against which people living in remote communities with their own cultural traditions that have been uh, suppressed and uh, uh, um, distorted by this larger context are coming to terms with how they go forward in their lives. So I view that, and as somebody who was a psychiatric consultant in the Arctic of Quebec, as a central mental health problem, as something for which mental health practitioners should have a response, should be looking for a response, and something for which, notwithstanding the role that vulnerability to depression and impulsivity and other kinds of personality traits that may have neurobiological dimensions, notwithstanding the, the role that that plays, cannot be understood and cannot be responded to independently of a good political, social, historical analysis and, and understanding of the current predicament, the current context, which I should say for youth now includes a global network, an international youth culture, mass media. Kids living in remote communities in the north are on the internet and are looking at things on YouTube and are responding to these things. Uh, people use uh, Facebook to narrate their everyday lives in their local community uh, as though it's a semi-private, semi-public space. Uh, so there are new forms of sociality that have both local and global dimensions that are central to our understanding of these kinds of health and social problems. So I've chosen that example instead of telling you about Africa or Nepal or here or there because uh, it's a statement in itself to say here we are in a corner of the world, it doesn't get any more privileged than we are and segments of our population are facing much the same dilemmas or, or magnitude of dilemmas that people are in other places. This is a map just of the disability uh, adjusted life years uh, so the, the sense of impact both of mortality and disability around, around the world uh, and uh, for the uh, general population, you see where the burden is predominantly. Uh, and then the models that people have are 
systemic, interactional, cybernetic models, but our interventions usually are not. So coming back to this theme of if we have a more sophisticated interactional model, how do we use that, how do we study that, and how do we put that into play? This is the remaining dilemma in global health and global mental health. So this is a diagram from one of the, the really the, the, the key figure in pushing ahead uh, the uh, global mental health agenda, Vikram Patel, uh, many other people, Martin Prince, um, um, uh, Arthur Kleinman, many other people have been very important in, in making this happen. Uh, and the models that people have uh, are, I think, rich and, and pay a lot of attention to context, but the way these things then get deployed are problematic. And I mentioned to you that behind this uh, talk that I'm giving you today is a book that I'm working on with the Foundation for Psychocultural Research with the same title. And the last section of the book tries to look a bit at global health. And one of the chapters in that uh, section is by an anthropologist, Coleman Applebaum, who studies uh, corporations. And one of the things he studies is pharmaceutical corporations. So it's good to have an anthropologist go and do that, get a fresh eye on uh, you know, an exotic world, and one that is, plays a very large role in shaping the world that we all live in. Uh, and one of his concerns in that is he talks about exactly this language of the global mental health movement, which is basically about scaling things up. The idea is we know what works, we know what some of the problems are, we know, for example, uh, that a, a big chunk of the uh, suffering that people have around the world is related to neuropsychiatric disorders, and a big chunk of that is related to depression. And so we know what depression is, we think we know what to do for depression, we just have to get it to people. So his argument is if, if your goal is to scale it up on the magnitude that they're talking about, you've pretty much preordained the likelihood that what you're doing is delivering drugs to people. So even if, uh, as the global mental health movement does, you're doing a lot of good research on psychosocial interventions, and you, Vikram Patel wrote a book called Where There Is No Psychiatrist, modeled on the Where, the, Where There Is No Doctor, a famous um, uh, Central American uh, document. Uh, it's full of good ideas that what can be done on a practical clinical level with minimal resources for village health workers to help people with common mental health problems. But when it comes to translating these things, we published an article some years ago in our journal by Sumit Jain and Sushir Jadav called uh, When Pills Swallow Policy. Uh, that talked about the dilemmas of trying to deploy community mental health in India when the psychiatrist comes once a month to visit uh, a community that it ends up being the lowest common denominator again of, of treatment. And it's a setting, take India as an example, as Stefan X and other people have shown, psychopharmaceuticals are easily available. They're constantly circulating. There's a local industry producing these things. So contrary to the notion that medicines are very rare and hard to get in most parts of the world, some of these medicines are not hard to get. What's hard to get is uh, more nuanced care that, that addresses the, your social predicaments or your ways of looking at the world and so on. Now that may exist, it may exist through indigenous forms of healing, it may exist in a variety of ways, but all this is an argument for the idea that the global mental health movement needs to go a bit beyond this kind of model. This is the newest package of these things uh, from the WHO called the MH Gap Intervention Guide. It lists a series of, you can get, download a copy of this for your own um, uh, interest. It lists a series of common problems uh, and uh, simple algorithms that people can follow to do a kind of step care in response to these things. Uh, and uh, I'll jump ahead for a moment. And so the idea is that uh, People in primary care with um, uh, limited training can recognize these core problems and can implement a series of interventions. And the concern is, how will this actually play out on the field? And there's a huge role for social scientists and for people who can go and look uh, with a kind of balanced and open view to see how these things are unfolding and how well they are or are not working. And those of us who are clinicians would have to say, though, uh, a priori, we're not so convinced we have all the best categories to describe problems, and we're not so convinced we have all the best treatments for things. Uh, so there needs to be much more activity in developing better interventions, not just getting the ones that we supposedly have now that are great, that we know in the case of depression, for example, have been uh, fabulously oversold uh, in terms of their in ter terms of antidepressant medication, uh, in terms of their um, their broad uh, utility. So this is the popular account of what I've been giving you a, sl a slightly more um, uh, a technical version of, uh, uh, in, uh, and it includes, in, for, for your interest, the, uh, the story of uh, antidepressants in Japan, uh, based a lot on the work of Junko Kitanaka, uh, a anthropologist at Keio University and other people. And uh, in the end, what uh, this is an argument for is taking that earlier discussion I gave you about where symptoms come from, what they're embedded in, the meaning systems, individual and communal meaning systems, and taking the interactional process we've been talking about and trying to apply that to an understanding of what's happening in context for people. Uh, and so that we can use that to make sense of the predicaments that people are in, uh, 
uh, and uh, in some ways um, um, be more uh, helpful in, in responding to those problems. In the end, I think we'll be led toward a kind of pluralistic view that it's not about one size fits all. It's not there's only one kind of human problem, and not everything is a broken brain. Some things are broken relationships. Some things are uh, broken environments. There, there's a whole lot of things that are relevant, and they're relevant to mental health. They're relevant to the core interests of mental health. Um, and that the solutions will be uh, multiple and plural because they'll be embedded in the ways of life and the resources that people have, the kinds of relationships they have, and so on. I don't want to soft pedal that, though. I think pluralism at a local level, at a global level, poses its own challenges. And you're living in the middle of it here in this society where you have such highly polarized views right now, to take the polarized view around uh, gun control in this society, an obvious mental health, public health intervention that is so long overdue. It's so sad that this is a society that has such a high uh, murder rate and use of guns and so on. It's not the case in many other comparably wealthy societies, and it's directly related to cultural values of the society. It, it's a lesson about the power of culture, just how difficult it is to have that discussion and how deeply affronted people feel uh, when you know the statistics are put in front of them and where they sort of see the story, and how unbelievably irrational people get actually in their counter arguments. I mean, the idea of arming people in elementary schools and so on. I mean, it, I have to tell you that from the po point of view of people elsewhere, I don't, I'm sure most people in this room are not going to disagree with me. Maybe somebody who watches this on YouTube will disagree. I'll look forward to that. But um, it's just completely crazy uh, for most people. The idea that that's some kind of a solution seems so counter commonsensical to everybody. So, but that's a great example, I think, of the, the broader context, again, that somehow has to be part of all of these discussions and that gets bracketed off entirely with the brain uh, discussions. It even gets bracketed off with the cultural discussions. After, after the last couple of these uh, uh, catastrophes, uh, you know, these, these mass shootings in the U.S., I've gotten con calls from journalists who, you know, find me on the web and say, oh, you're a cultural psychiatrist. Tell me about Amok, you know? <laughs> uh, and it's like saying, this is so beside the point. I mean, I, how, what is this going to tell you about, you know, yes, it's true. You know, there is, and there's even a neurobiology, you know, men are, you know, a little more aggressive than whatever, and men are status conscious. And you can make a whole story about this, and, and men who feel insulted go off and brood and blah, blah, blah. You can make a whole story, but it really doesn't take you very far, in, either on an individual level or certainly not on a social level, explaining why a phenomenon becomes more widespread in, in, in many different versions. So there's something about we needing a more sophisticated language to talk about the neurobiology, but equally about the social environment. And of the two, the social environment becomes very challenging because it is so political. And as soon as you try to talk about it in a more nuanced way, uh, things get sorted out or get polarized in terms of what, what camp do you belong in. So again, it's a plea for the value of social scientists who make it their, their métier to try to understand uh, these systemic uh, processes. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in pursuing this further, uh, we have an annual summer school at McGill. It's, uh, this uh, is uh, it's going to be its 19th year. Uh, and we have a month-long uh, discussion of these kinds of issues in cultural psychiatry and other related areas. Uh, and we also have an annual advanced study institute that's just a few days long that focuses on a particular topic each year. And this coming year, it's going to be on mindfulness and cultural context. So it's part of this globalization I've been talking about. Things flow in different directions. So from uh, Buddhist traditions, people have borrowed uh, certain kinds of ideas about how the mind works and how you can uh, train it to function better. But interestingly enough, they've taken something that in context is fundamentally an ethical system and turned it into a matter of being more efficient uh, in your life and uh, and so on, so it's, it raises interesting questions about what's going on and whether we should you know we should discuss that. That's what we're hoping to have is an interesting discussion around that with a variety of people. I thank you very much for your close attention. <clears throat>